Tooth, Terry Bolo here, Trudy from the original Terry, and you are listening to Tommy Throwback Kodak on Splat from the Past. Fun fact, if you tickle Tommy, he purrs just like Catwoman. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now, I am excited for today's interview. Um, this has been a long time coming. I will be interviewing Scott Michaels. He was the owner, proprietor of Dearly Departed Tours in L.A., which was a memorabilia shop dedicated to all the movie stars of the golden age of Hollywood who died tragically. I'm having him on the show today to talk about all that stuff, talk about, you know, conspiracy theories of, of um, mysterious deaths of Hollywood, um, stuff like that. He was also the technical consultant on Quentin Tarantino's uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and I'm going to talk to him about that as well, and I am just so excited. I cannot wait. This is going to be a fun interview. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Scott Michaels. Hey, Scott. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I am doing terrific. Thank you for the kind welcome, and thank you for asking. My pleasure. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. It's a pleasure. You've got some great guests. Um, it's an honor for me. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I've, I've been very lucky. There's no other way of me describing it. I've, I've just been so lucky. But um, going back in uh, time, how did your interest in Hollywood and the dark side of it come about? Well, my, my interest in the dark side sort of just happened organically. I, I uh, was around uh, in, in a place, I grew up in, a, in, a, in an intersection in Detroit, a high traffic intersection, high fatality rate intersection. It was mm -hmm. a residential neighborhood. If you were to look it up, it doesn't look very intimidating at all. But the streets were configured in such a way that it was very dangerous. And back in the 60s and the 70s, when drinking laws weren't as tough as they are these days, a lot of drunk people would get into accidents in front of my house. <laughs> and a lot of people were killed in front of my house. Yeah. And I sort of saw the accidents, I saw the dead people, and it was while I was growing up. So I didn't know it to be any different. So I was sort of desensitized to things like that. And I became attracted isn't quite the word I would want to use, but I, I, my curiosity was piqued and I wasn't afraid to... Uh, to explore it. So I, I parlayed that interest or that exposure into you know, going to cemeteries and things like that. And then, uh, you know, started shoveling famous people's graves. I left Detroit and I moved to Chicago and spent a lot of time in the cemeteries there. Uh, this was long before the internet, before, you know, it sort of became, um, you know, a thing. I was just doing my own thing at that point, but it just ultimately snowballed into what I'm doing today. It, uh, it's a, I was a long answer, but a, a short answer when you, uh, when it's, uh, when I look at the big picture. Yeah. Uh, d did you watch uh, a lot of classic horror movies growing up? You know, I was more of a TV sitcom kind of guy. Uh, I, I know that the weirdo episodes that were scary stood out to me, uh, but I was never uh, really attracted to horror films. In 68 or 69, I saw Night of the Living Dead, and that, that, did, uh, that did sort of strike a chord with me, most definitely. Uh, yeah. So, But scary moments in TV shows and things like that uh, that were considered normal, like, like the Brady Bunch or something like that. You know, I remember them <laughs> specifically seeing you know, a ghost outside their window, and it really freaked me out. And, uh, you know, it was, if you look back now, it's sort of silly. But those are the sort of things that uh, interest me more. It was when uh, odd things happen to people that I was familiar with. You know what I mean? Not just yeah. setting out to be scared, but hang, hanging out with a family like the Brady Bunch and something happened to them really struck a chord with me rather than seeing a horror movie. Yeah, did you, did you collect any uh, memorabilia or posters or anything? You know, I was really into Star Wars and stuff like that when that came out in 77. I, I collected a lot of that stuff. And then when I was into the the Rocky Horror Picture Show when that, uh, about 79 or 78, I started collecting stuff like that. But 
uh, it, that sort of spiraled into my weird obsession with collecting bits of history. Uh, that the, you know, mostly terrible things have happened, but I suppose you want to get into that in a bit. Of course, yeah. <laughs> what so? <laughs> So before um, you you got to L.A. and, and all of that, uh, what, what what was your original career trajectory? If had you none. had one. <laughs> uh, I went to high school. I had no interest in going to college. Uh, I just knew it wasn't for me. And uh, I chose a career in, uh, I went to a trade school, a broadcasting school called Spex Howard, who was a, a really uh, well-known uh I don't want to say disc jockey, but an online personality in Detroit who opened his own school, and uh, and that was what that was my chosen uh, education was being in radio. My career in radio didn't last very long, but it turned out to be the best thing you know I ever did because I learned how to uh, you know present to be a presenter. We we were taught television as well, and uh, so I was able, now I'm able to host documentaries and and uh, be more comfortable with the way with speaking and and uh, appearing on camera, and thus I ended up in a lot of things. So the only thing I, I remember from Detroit, the only thing that I use that I grew up using is my is my education in broadcasting and my typing class in high school. Those are the <laughs> two things that uh, that I retain. Yeah. Were, were you a shock jock on the radio? No, no. I, were, I was a country music radio station. <laughs> I, worked, I hosted a country music, uh, you know, a, a drive time uh, shift on that. And then when I moved to Chicago, I worked on a uh, pop pop radio station for a while, too. But then my career didn't last long with that. My education lasted longer. But, uh, but no, my career in radio was brief. Wow. Yeah, I mean, when I started this podcast, you know, I mean, I grew up idolizing Howard Stern, so I wanted to, to give the people a, a show that they could listen to while driving, you know, or do, mm-hmm. doing something constructive, you know. And everyone's you know, keeps telling me why can't why can't you do a Zoom podcast? It's like I, Zoom is so lame because every, everyone's delayed, you know, by a few seconds, you know, with each response, and everyone looks and talks like a robot, you know. It's just it's weird. <laughs> time that we're in right now, you know, that that's become normal, and it's sad that uh, the people that are in grade school and early high school now, this is their reality, and this is the way it's going to be from now on for them, but, but for us, you know, I don't know, I'm not sure how old you are, but I'm, I'm, I'm in my mid-50s, and I remember no phones, and I remember no computers, and, and so it's sad to me that it's just become, everyone has to go that way now, there's no choice. Yeah, I'm the oldest 37 year old you'll ever meet. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, I grew up. Was I grew up in Detroit, and uh, there was a radio station called W4, and uh, and Stern worked on that station before he moved to New York. And uh, Steve Dahl, who was another, he was a shock jock that started off in uh, in Detroit as well. He's the one that was uh, well known for. Um, creating the riot at Comiskey Park, the Disco is Dead riot. They blew up Disco Records and uh, tore apart Comiskey Park in Chicago. That was, uh, that was an interesting time. Those two guys started on this little radio station in Detroit, and now they're, uh, well, Stern most definitely, much bigger personality, but yeah. um, they were fun to listen to. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you move to L.A., and then you start working for an- another um, a tour- touring company, right? That's right, yeah. After leaving Detroit, I spent about nine years in Chicago, and then uh, I moved to uh, Los Angeles in 94, uh, about a month after the Northridge earthquake, uh, and I worked for another company uh, called Graveline Tours, and Graveline was sort of the first, uh, you know, there was Hollywood Babylon, which was a nonsense book that Kenneth Anger wrote in the 70s. He just made up terrible stories about uh, famous people. But it was the only book of its kind, and it turned so much, uh, so many of us into the so, sort of dead celebrity genre. And then there was Graveline Tours, and uh, I became friends with the owner. And the owner left, uh, he moved back east and asked me to take over the company. So I did that for a few years, and uh, which was great. We drove around Hollywood in a little hearse converted hearse and uh, that was back when Hollywood was still Hollywood you know before all the destruction started happening all the construction uh, so uh, so yeah I was with Graveline for about three years and I moved to England wow and so you you, you moved to England uh, how long were you there for I was there about six years mm-hmm and uh, yeah it was great I loved living in England I, I missed the uh, I missed the California climate which is why I 
actually, I went over there because I was in a relationship, and that that obviously didn't work out. Yeah. And uh, but I stayed for another couple of years after after we broke up, just to make sure that I was going to be leaving the country uh, when I'm comfortable with leaving, not because some things didn't work out. So I, I, I waited another couple of years, and I moved back on my own because I just I couldn't. You know, it's dark and gloomy in England, and and that's wonderful because you know the people that live there are lovely people, and that's the way they were. That's the way they grew up, and they can jet over to Spain or to Barcelona, you know, to uh, uh, know, for the Czech Republic on a, on a whim, you know, just for a weekend to get away. And I decided that I needed a little bit more sunshine, so I came back to California. Nice, nice. So what year did you um, start uh, Dearly Departed Tours? Uh, well, I started, it was uh, 2004 was when I started the company, and my very first tour I did was January 1st, 2005. So, uh, so yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, but when you were working for the other one, is that when you started, uh, you know, learning about, uh, you know, the mysterious deaths and all the the, the celebrity stuff that that happened? Yeah, when I when I was still in Chicago, I picked up a book that uh, was published in the mid mid to late eighties called "The Death of James Dean." Yeah. And it was written by a guy named Warren Beef. And it was the first time I'd ever written a book solely about somebody famous who died and how they died and the ins and outs of how they died. And it was uh, fascinating. It was well written, well written, extremely well researched. And, uh, and, and it sort of, it really clicked with me that that was, that was what interested me the most. And I've always been pretty impractical. Uh, I've made decisions that were not really, uh, what they always say, the ones that scare you the most are the ones that pay off the best, I think is what they say, or something like that. And uh, But I just pursued that and said yes to some things that normal people would say no to, and uh, it ended up being here. So Warren's book was influential because I knew there was a market for it. And I was going to libraries when we still had to you know, get microfilm to, uh, to, to read old articles. There weren't books written about these people yet. And, uh, and, uh, you know, getting death certificates and things like that. So it, it came to, uh, you know, it was through Warren's book and, and just my own curiosity that, uh, that really got me into this. And I was, after since then, I was clipping obituaries and filing them. And, uh, you know, it just, it's just a weird little passion that I grabbed onto, latched onto. Yeah. So, so what are some of the the big, the biggest mysterious Hollywood deaths that you discovered along the way that stick with you to this day? Well, the before you know, this is again. This sounds, this sounds like I'm being uh, pretentious, or I, and I don't mean it to be that way. And I don't, I don't necessarily think I, I, if I was I paved the way for anything. But I'll tell you, when I got off the plane for the first time in Los Angeles, and a friend of mine picked me up in his hearse. And uh, the guy with the Graveline guy and took me to Marilyn Monroe's house where she died. And it was like two in the morning. And I stood on top of his car and looked over the fence. And nowadays you just get arrested or every you know security camera in the world will be blasting at you. But back then it was a little bit more innocent time. <laughs> and, uh, and that really being able to see where Marilyn ended, you know, and that's always been the interest of mine is I want to see exactly where that person ended and we're to see the house where Marilyn died was a real was a real magical moment for me uh, you know I realized then that 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 was the career I wanted I, I loved doing that the history of uh, the tragedy is, is what really interested me that's when I realized it yeah I mean there's there's some uh, mysterious deaths that you know still haven't been quite explained even though some people think they, they, they know uh, what may have happened, you know, like Natalie Wood, for example. Yeah, 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 I see, I, I'm again, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist. Yeah. I think that there's a, the simplest answer is usually the right answer. Uh, that's my opinion. And also, when you're talking about things that are of that magnitude, I'll say Marilyn, I'll say Princess Diana, uh, people, those two people, nobody wants to believe that they died uh, from something silly, like, I don't want to say silly, that sounded bad, nobody wants to think that it was just a stupid drunk driver that killed Diana because of what happened afterwards, because of her funeral, because of the international event. Marilyn Monroe's another one. Nobody wants to believe it was a sleepy blonde who took too many pills uh, because, because she had associations with a lot of important people. And those deaths, there are a lot of people that went, wow, don't have to worry about that ever again because they knew a lot of information. So that's where the conspiracy stuff comes in because there were convenient deaths for a lot of people. 
And, uh, you know, if Maryland was involved with the Kennedys, they probably breathed a sigh of relief. Whether they had a direct hand, I don't subscribe to that personally. I think that she was, um, mm -hmm. I think that she was used by a lot of people, but I don't think anyone else has tr blood on their hands. Uh, same with Diana. I think that Diana was uh, a pawn for a lot of other people, the royal family, et cetera, and they didn't like the way she was behaving. So when she died, and I do believe it was accidentally, uh, a lot of people went, well, okay, she won't make us any pro uh, trouble anymore, you know? So uh, I mean, Natalie Wood is a different one because the two other people on that ship refused to talk about it for many years. And... Uh, and then, then there was that whole tobacco on the, on the anniversary of it with them reopening the case, which I never really understood. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, there's just because there's not a lot of information coming out that, that would solve these problems. There's no one, I don't know, Christopher Walken or, or, or Robert Wagner could probably clear it up, but they just don't want to. And uh, I, I think personally, if it was Natalie, was, uh, if there anyone was responsible, I think it was because they let her go and they yeah. knew she was too drunk that's my that's my take on it um mm. but she was a life wire she was a live wire and uh and people were just annoyed with her probably she was a live wire she couldn't swim unfortunately yeah, yeah but she owned a yacht and she spent a lot of time on it so uh you know you can't i, I can't i can't use the the drowning afraid of the water thing because they were on their island and on that yacht all the time yeah, it was it was a it was a strange circumstance. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, what what one big uh, mysterious one for me is uh, John Eric Hexum. Like, well, okay, why is that ex why is that mysterious? Be because I I because I don't know if it was if it was an accident or a suicide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was it was it was a strange one. You know, I mean that doesn't happen on on um on on movie or TV sets often. You know, it's not like with, um, what's his name, Vic Morrow on the Twilight Zone uh, set with with a helicopter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what Hexum did was stupid, you know, mm -hmm. by putting a gun up to his head thinking it was a blank and nothing was going to come out was dumb. Uh, and also the fact now, I mean, the laws changed after that, of course, and they have people on set dealing specifically with weapons. Same with the Twilight Zone thing. Unfortunately, those... Uh, you know, something terrible has to happen for precedence to uh, be established. But, uh, but yeah, Hexum, that was no sort of a dumb thing for him to do. It was, yeah. And, of course, there's Fatty Arbuckle. Yeah, you know, poor Roscoe. <laughs> he, really <laughs> got, he really got screwed over. I, I just don't, uh, um, you know, a lot of people benefit from, benefited from that one, and unfortunately he... Uh, he was uh, he was tossed away after that. It's unfortunate. Yeah, I just uh, interviewed W. C. Fields' grandson, and he told me, yeah, the family wasn't surprised when they, when they found out about him and stuff. His career was down the tubes by that point, and he was very depressed and bitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is really sad. Yeah, it is. And I talked to uh, those guys worked at a time when there were no such things as royalties or residuals. So yeah, uh, so you know when they, when they talk about I'll just pick a name, Bela Lugosi, for instance. Bela Lugosi died in a crappy little apartment in Hollywood. Yeah. People go, oh, how can such a great star, have, how could that have happened? Well, those guys worked when they got paid one time and one time only. And it was tax-free, but $15,000 to, to star in a motion picture was a lot of money back then. And uh, Mansions and Living High takes that money away. So, um, yeah, so unfortunately the people back then uh, you know, they didn't get taxed a lot and they made a lot, but they didn't think it was going to dry up. And poor Roscoe, uh, it certainly happened to him too. Yeah. I, I talked to, um, Bela Lugosi Jr. too, uh, about that and stuff. You know, it's funny, uh, that the $20 million salary that a lot of actors get today, back in 1931, when Bela Lugosi played Dracula, it was only a thousand dollars or something like that. Not even. Yeah, it's sad. It really is. And and when you think about Universal Studios, and it's the monsters that put Universal on the map, you know, Frankenstein and the mummy, etc. And for up until about 10 years ago, I never saw a single image of Bela Lugosi at Universal Studios. So, um, 
you know, Bella Jr. was an integral part of, of people getting, you know, sort of likeness rights, which was uh, important, you know, for people to sell posters or, or models, et cetera, with his father's image on them. Uh, I think he was, I think he represented the Stooges, too. Uh, mm-hmm. They, um, you know, it, so they were getting something back. It was, uh, it's, it's sad when these people have done things that are so influential, and nobody had the foresight to think that they were, you know, that, that these things were going to end. Like, I don't know, like, like Gilligan's Island, you know, those guys get paid two, three thousand dollars an episode, and, uh, and rights for two reruns. Who would have thought 50, 60 years later they'd still be running? It's, uh, so unfortunately there were no plans set for people like that. And DVDs come out, and videotapes came out, and streaming television came out, and they're all capitalizing on these poor people's images. Not poor, but unfortunately uh, not, m- not well represented uh, in that regard. And uh, there's a lot of people making money off of these people, and uh, they weren't around to enjoy it themselves. And Netflix, they're bringing back the the paying one time thing. Unfortunately, from, from what I've been told, yeah, yeah, it's 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 crazy. What's what, what's your take on the Black Dahlia? Yeah, I I I don't know enough about it uh, to be honest with you. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I I know enough to. I'm not a huge fan of Steve Hodel's theory, uh, the Black Dahlia Avenger guy. You know, and I knew another woman. Her name was Janice Knowlton, who claims her father did it. Uh, I, I can't say, you know. And there's probably going to be a really simple answer: this this doctor did it, or this so and so did it. Yeah. I don't know. I've never studied it enough to 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 speak uh, uh, with authority on that uh, on on her murder. My my fascination and obsession is. Is uh, goes to the Tate LaBianca murders or the Manson murders. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, I know that uh, you're not, you're not much of a conspiracy theory guy, but do you think that in the future, with 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 with, with um, th- things happening in Hollywood and deaths and, and what have you, there's not going to be any more conspiracy theories because of the internet and, and information gets passed around. I, you know, I don't know anymore because there's this whole thing called the dark web, which I know nothing about, and I don't think I want to know anything about. There's there's other theories about, uh, you know, world leaders being, you know, the, the Illuminati and all that sort of business. I, I don't know. I don't know. And the thing is, I'm glad I'm getting older because I don't <laughs> think I want to know. Uh, there's too much information at my fingertips as it is. And, uh, and when I turn on the news or you know, look at anything. I just think, well, I'm glad I'm not young. I really am because I don't, I don't want to know what's going to happen after I'm gone. You know, it doesn't. I, I just can't. It, it's, it's too tiresome and too sad. Yeah, I'm a little Im- immersed in the quote unquote dark web. I, you know, I, I read things all the time that I just cannot believe. It's just mean stuff people, you know, come up with and stuff like, you know, they're saying that Spielberg and Tom Hanks are involved in pedophilia and all this stuff. And, you know, it's just, it, it's, it, I don't see any evidence, you know, of it. It's, it's but terrible. What is really frightening is that there is evidence of people being involved that are high up. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the thing. It's like nothing is. It's impossible to think anymore, and yeah. uh, and that's where that's why it's so depressing. You know, you've heard about uh, you know Corey Hell uh, Feldman have been talking about that for years, and yeah. lo and behold, here come these stories. So um, yeah, it's it's again. I just I, I I'd like to I'd rather use my imagination and and <laughs> read a book <laughs> than, yeah. than have all these horrible <laughs> things spelled out to me every time I open a computer. Yeah, uh, it's it's insane. But uh, when you started the um, the tours and you uh, opened the shop, I mean, did, did it take a while for it to catch on? Well, sure. There was this. There was a thing when I first started. There was a company called Gold Star Events that just launched, and Gold Star oh, Events yeah. was like half off tickets or something. Right. right? And uh, and I was one of the original like fifteen people that that. Uh, that listed my business on Gold Star. So it was still a pretty uh, new concept. And that Gold Star events kept me uh, in business for like the first year. I was living solely on that. And uh, and then little by little, you know, we started getting a, a more press and, uh, and you know, became more popular. And uh, then I was able to, you know, sort of uh, selling, my tickets started selling on their own. Uh, for the first, I guess eight years or so.
so or nine years. It was only me and a bus, and uh, and that was it. And then I hired another driver named Richard, who was terrific, and um, I got a second bus and opened it, opened up a shop eventually. So the shop didn't come into uh, into play until about I don't know uh, about seven years ago or something like that. And uh, and then it, I started bringing my collection into the shop where because I, I wanted a place where people could sit and use the bathroom and you know relax a little bit before the tour. Then I started bringing my collection in, and uh, it, it wasn't ever a big deal, you know. It was just so here's some knickknacks, things behind. Uh, I put them in a glass case, a little glass case, and people really respond to that too. So we started collecting more things, and ultimately opened up a larger museum uh, on Santa Monica Boulevard. So. And that's another thing. It just spiraled. It started with me on a street corner with a bus, and uh, and ultimately uh, it came into this museum. And I had about eight people working for me. And now <laughs> today it's me and a bus again, meeting on street corners. So it's a uh, and everything else is in storage. It's an odd, odd circle. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I was lucky enough to go uh, to the store twice uh, last year. Uh, to see Terry, and uh, mm -hmm. I enjoyed uh, going to the store. Um, I remember, though, the first time I went, I got a little bit of um, post-traumatic stress disorder seeing uh, Jane Mansfield's um, car um, because I was in a car crash about five years ago. Uh, that was pretty bad and stuff. I told Terry about it later. She's like, "Oh God, I'm so sorry. I forgot to tell you." I was like, "No, no, it, it was okay. You know, it was it was very interesting to see it." Yeah, there's something about that car that's, uh, I mean, uh, going back to the Kenneth Anger book, Hollywood Babylon, that was published in the 70s. I mean, I was reading that when I was a little kid, and I saw a picture of that car, and it really, it, it's mesmerizing to me. Uh, you know, it, it, there's this beautiful blonde woman, Jane Mansfield, who was uh, killed in this horrific way. So ultimately ending up owning that car was, was uh, is uh, bizarre. And uh, it's a weird piece of history, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So when did uh, Terry start working there? Um, Terry started working for me, I think, about it was about six years ago. We met because uh, we used to belong to uh, an organization, a tour guide association, and uh, and Harry, Terry worked at the um, at the Welcome Center at Hollywood and Highland, and they would stock my brochures. Uh, when I started my company. So when I dropped off my brochures, I, that's how I met Terry. And ultimately, you know, Terry has a real love for Hollywood and is, a, is an excellent tour guide. And socially, we just uh, met a few times, and uh, and then I interviewed her, actually. I, 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 I asked her if she wouldn't mind me interviewing her. I've seen it, and yeah. We became friends, and she started working for me back then because Terry's such a, such a nice, lovely person. And she used to welcome people to Hollywood in the Welcome Center, and then she she welcomed people to dearly departed tours for several years, so she's uh, she's actually still with me, which is great. Yes, she is. Uh, there, there's there's no one nicer than Terry Bolo, and uh, you, you know I, I I'm a guy who believes that people come into your life for a reason. Uh, she's been my just my biggest supporter, and I I really didn't ex expect it uh, to happen. <clears throat> And, and stuff you know I'm just a, a lifelong fan of like seeing her play this tiny part here in a movie and stuff like that because I'm, I'm somebody who knows his people you know and I, I believe that there's no um, there's there's no um, small actor there's no there's no small parts just small actors you know and uh, that's one of the reasons why you know I wanted to talk to Terry the first time that we did and stuff yeah yeah it's, it's fascinating to to uh to hear her talk and, and to hear the things she's involved with. And then going through your podcast and finding all those amazing people that you've interviewed. And, mm -hmm. and that, that's the wonderful thing about them is so many of them aren't people that you know by name. But you look at the photographs and you're like, oh my gosh, I know that guy. I know her. I know him. So it was yeah. really, uh, it was really, it's, it's, it's neat that somebody recognizes them and they, they have stories to tell, just like you know, the people that are on screen all the time. I mean, they, these people, the, the, like you said, the, uh, the less featured players have much more interesting lives. Yes, I, I would rather talk to um, a journeyman actor than a star any day because the star does not open up to you unless you're a Barbara Walters or a Larry King. You know, I've found that out talking to like Ed Asner 
and, and people like that and stuff. I, I just would rather talk to someone like Terry, who's got all these great stories, you know, and she, you know, she doesn't talk badly about anybody. She's just so kind. It's just, it's, it's a pleasant conversation to talk to her. And, you know, she's got a great sense of humor, you know, she can be like one of the guys, you know, <laughs> and stuff. Definitely, yeah. No, she's a hoot. She is a hoot. Yeah. Um, me and my mother, we had lunch with her um, at the Rainbow last year, uh, one of the times I was in town, and we just had uh, a grand old time. And uh, we took a picture outside of the place, and she was like, I remember standing here in 1974 with Jack Nicholson and Warren Beatty. <laughs> yeah. Terry's got a really, she's got an incredible memory. Yeah, she does. She really does. Ha have any of the uh, family members of the, um, of, of the dead celebrities, uh, have, have, they ever, have they ever come into your shop and thanked you for keeping their memory alive? Hmm. Well, that's interesting. I, I, I can't, uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, now over the years, because I started, when I was living in England, I started a website called findadeath.com. And it was when the internet first started off, and it was, I just figured, you know, what the hell, I'll put some pictures up of where famous people died, because I did that with Graveline, you know, when I, when I did that, when I did that tour, uh, that's what I was doing. So when I moved to England, uh, I started my website, and because I figured people would want to see things uh, uh, that they can't get to, you know, mm -hmm. by, by plane. Some people are never going to travel to England, so I would take pictures of places where people died in England, famous people like Jimi Hendrix and, and Judy Garland, etc. And I put them online. So uh, mine was the first website to do that sort of thing. And I did get, you know, interesting people, interesting emails from people, uh, positive and negative, because I was never really, uh, I was free with my opinions. I still am. Yeah. Uh, I'm still free <laughs> with my opinions. But uh, when I was putting stuff up online originally, you know, you don't really, don't realize the amount of people that are actually going to be uh, reading these things. And one of the, one of the features I remember I wrote about was Milton Berle. Mm -hmm. And Milton Berle was not, <laughs> I, you know, he, maybe he was a he was a talented guy, a very successful guy. But personally, I think he was a, a jerk. Yeah. And he was a bit of a pig too. He was he was always a he would never survive one moment in the Me Too yeah. era. He was just you know gross. And the way the way he handled women, and he expected women to handle him literally. So, but then I knew he had a son, and I knew the son, uh, uh, you know, through an actress who he sort of jilted, and he knew he had a son, but he never acknowledged the son. Oh. So I wrote about this, and I said that I thought Milton was a jerk because of this, and I heard from the son saying, "Thank you for you know saying that about me. Uh, I appreciate that." So, mm -hmm. you know, things, things like that uh, I have heard, and then I did another story about a woman named Paula Yates who who was. Uh, 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 living with uh, Michael Hutchins when he died in Australia, and I made a couple of cracks about her because because at that point I was very tacky. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm less tacky. I'm still tacky, but that, that I made a couple of really cheap jokes at her expense, and and some of her family reached out to me and told me I was a jerk. Uh, Jennifer Syme, again, this is a person that not a lot of people know. I saw the movie Twin Peaks, and it's a, dedicated to Jennifer Syme. So I was curious, and I looked her up, and I found out that she was, uh, she worked for David Lynch, and she was uh, in a relationship with Keanu Reeves, and she died in a car accident. So I started doing more research about that. And, uh, and I found out that she had a baby with Keanu, but the, uh, the baby didn't survive. And uh, she was partying at Marilyn Manson's house and ended up getting really high and really drunk and going home and getting her own car, being dropped off at home and going back and flipping her car and getting killed. Now, this is a fact. These are facts, and it's because of David Lynch that I know that fact because it was in the credits. So, But her mother reached out to me and called me every name in the book and told me I was an awful person to take it off completely. And it's like, well, no, it's a, it's a curious story, and uh, and I think it deserved to be told. And But, you know, it was it, didn't, it rubs people the wrong way. Where I go sometimes rubs people the wrong way. And uh, so, yeah, and then I, I've had people come out and say, uh, say things like that to me, and, but I've had some nice things, so it, it balances out. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny, Milton Berle hosted Saturday Night Live in 1978, and it never aired, and I asked the staff writer Ann Beats why, and she said because Lauren Michaels didn't approve of, of him taking his dick out to all the females on the show. Yeah. I was like, wow. Yeah, because it was a trivia, it was a, it was a trivia thing that came up back in the 90s on Comedy Central that I wasn't even aware of that uh he had hosted saturday night live but it never aired and i was like wow when, I, when she told me why i was just like wow that is <clears throat> that is in- incredible oh my god you know and and uh but some it's like um you know he did a, an award show i think it was the mtv awards and he was on stage with uh it was with who Scott, hello? You there? Did we lose you? And now you're wearing them. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> wow, that was ugly. But RuPaul, you know, he regretted saying that. Uh, but but it just, um, you know, it just shows how nasty people are. Now, another interesting thing, uh, another interesting person, there's a guy by the name of William Marshall. And William oh, yeah. Marshall was in, he was Blackula in, in, yes. the, in the 72, I think it was. Uh, the, it was a black exploitation film, and it was the Black Dracula, Blackula. And he also is uh, known for... The King of Cartoons. Exactly, the King of <laughs> Cartoons. Yes, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. So uh, I was talking to some people who were on my tour one day, and I said to them, I don't know what they said. Their name was Marshall, and uh, and just for the hell of it, I just said, "Are you are you related to William Marshall?" He said, "My my brother was a was a movie actor. That's what it was." I said, "Was he William Marshall?" I go, yeah, he was. I go, you're kidding. I'm mean, a huge fan. And uh, <laughs> I said to him, you know, would you like a copy of his death certificate? Because I have them. And it was on my computer. And I go, sure. So I went click, 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 boom. I printed it up. And there they had, you know, William Marshall's death certificate. So I mean, they were really great people. And they appreciated it. And they liked the fact that he was being remembered. Uh, and uh, and that's that's the thing. It's like they're not forgot. That's, 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 these people, it may not be the way, the, the, the way they want to be remembered or want it to be remembered, but they are remembered, and that's what's important. <clears throat> mm-hmm, absolutely. Do, do, do you know a lot about the, um, the haunted houses and everything in Hollywood? Well, I know, I know a lot about the really famous ones. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know a bit. Yeah, um, uh, Larry Jacobson. She's a friend of mine. She's you know written books about about them and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, she used to be a waitress at the comedy store. She had a, uh, she saw some some ghost encounters there. Uh, there's a there's a house above the comedy store where the comedians um, used to live uh, when they were just starting out called the Crest Hill House. That place isn't haunted, but I but I think it should be because I've heard so many hilarious stories about partying that went up there. Yeah, there's a lot of memories, uh, you know, and I, I'm also, I'm a believer in, uh, I definitely believe in ghosts. I've seen enough of that to, 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 uh, to believe in it completely. And, uh, but I'm also tend to believe that I'm more of a, uh, that's not an orb, that's dust kind of person. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, but I've been on several investigations and I do think that people, meaning the dead people or spirits are going to be uh, attracted to a place where they felt joy and where they experienced things that made them happy uh, rather than in a cemetery or in a funeral home, which is where most people are afraid. Uh, I think they're more, they're more apt to be someplace where they have good memories, like movie studios, for instance, and places mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Did, has, uh, do you know if A.J. Benza ever came to the shop? No, I know AJ, and he's never been to the shop. No, he hasn't. I did a couple of episodes. In fact, I just shot one um, uh, a couple of weeks ago with the Ghost Adventures people, and they've been in the shop. Uh, but uh, but no, I, AJ's never been in the shop. Okay, because I, I used to watch him on Mysteries and Scandals. That's where I first discovered Lori, too, as a matter uh-huh. of fact. Yeah, if I, if I could choose any two women to be my aunt, it would be Terry and it would be Lori, because they're just so supportive of me. Mm-hmm. You uh, were a technical consultant on uh, Quentin Tarantino's uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That's right, yes. Yeah, how did that come about? And that guy must have been an honor. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was. 
doing something else. I, I, about uh, oh, uh, 10 years ago, I did a documentary, and it's called The Six Degrees of Helter Skelter. Mm-hmm. And it was a my, my uh, partner uh, in podcast and, uh, and in documentary. His name is Mike Dorsey, a filmmaker. And Mike mm-hmm. and I did this documentary uh, yeah, a long time ago. And it was a geographic retelling of the crimes. It wasn't a, you know, how could this have happened thing. It was, this is how it happened, this is where it happened, this is why it happened. And there were a lot of weird little nuggets of trivia in there that that I tend to gravitate towards. I like knowing weird things. Like, I, you know, I went to the library back in the 80s to find, because I wanted to know Sharon Tate's phone number. You know, weird things like that. So um, a couple of years ago, I got a message uh, from uh, somebody who worked for me saying that Quentin Tarantino's office called and he wants to meet with me. And uh, so I figured I was going to go to this office, and I figured I'd be in a, a room full of 20 people. And uh, I was greeted at reception by, uh, by his uh, director, second director, and uh, introduced to a lot of other people, Barbara Ling, who was the production designer. And they said, well, you want to meet QT? And I was like, sure. So we went to his office, and I was introduced, and the door was shut, and it was he and I talking for about an hour about uh, the Tate LaBianca murders. And... Uh, and, he, and my, there was a copy of my documentary on his desk, and he said, "This I love this. This was great, and uh, and I want to talk more about that." So we we talked for quite a while about you know the different motives for the case and uh, and the different odd bits of trivia, and I set it up uh, where they set it up with me, and I took Quentin and uh, and his about four people around uh, to different locations. And uh, one of the locations that they wanted to see was J.C. Brings Old House. And um, J.C. Brings House is owned by friends of mine. So I took them up there and, and uh, we went up to Cielo Drive to walk up walk up and down Cielo Drive. And it was really, it was really a lot of fun. And throughout the, uh, the production, they reached out to me and, and asked me, you know, certain questions about uh, bits of trivia, like they wanted to know the sheet music that was on the piano in the living room where the murders occurred. They wanted to know the book that Abigail Folger was reading in bed when Susan Atkins grabbed her and took her out to the living room. So uh, those are the kind of nuggets of information that he wanted, and uh, and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun being able to provide that, being able to see the uh, the, my, the results of what I told him, you know, on screen. I, I met with... Uh, uh, Mark Lindsay from Paul Revere and the Raiders about five years ago. Yeah. And he told me that uh, he and Terry Melcher wrote the word, the song is Good Times and uh, Him or Me on the uh, piano in the room where the murders occurred. And I know that the room was furnished. Uh, they Sharon and Roman rented the, the furniture uh, from the owner of the house. It came with it. So the same piano that these songs were written on was in the room when the murders occurred. And I told Tarantino about that, and he was, like, clicked with him. He's like, wow, that is really cool. Well, those two songs, you know, ended up in the movie. So I, I, I you know, I don't think I'm full of myself. I think I can take credit for that. And, uh, and so there's a, there's a few of the things that I told them that ended up in the movie, and I knew that that was directly because of me. And that felt, made me feel really good. And he gave me a screen credit, which was, you know, amazing. To see my name on a screen in a Tarantino movie was pretty cool. Yeah, oh my god. I saw the movie twice in the theater, including the extended version. I, I, I have it on DVD. I'm just, uh, I am so obsessed with this movie. I think it's by far the the absolute best thing he's done in a long time. Yeah, it's going to be, too, when, when the rest of it comes out. There's about another hour's worth of footage that's going to come out next year. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, it was, because they didn't use uh, Sebring's house, and I know they shot up there. They didn't use Sebring, Sebring's uh, salon, and I know they recreated it. That was one of the shoots I was on. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that didn't show up yet. And I, I met with, uh, met with, I had a chat with Barbara Ling, who was the production designer, and she said, oh, well, you know he made like a four-and-a-half-hour movie. It'll all show up. So, uh, so yeah, it'll, it, it's going to be out. It will be out. Nice. Yeah, I talked to uh, the stuntman Gary Kent, who uh, Brad Pitt is b- based, you know, on in the movie, and he told me, you know, exactly what happened, you know, uh, but, uh, you know that Manson really did let the air out of his tire, and he did hit him, not quite as elaborately as in, in the movie, but it did happen because he they were shooting a Western, and he was, um, you know, causing trouble on the set, and they asked him to leave, you know. It was a good story. I, I got, yeah, it is. I mean, there's so much... That's what's so interesting, and I, I always thought that the victims, the you know Sharon Tate and Jay Sebring and the others, 
I always thought that that they would die when this generation dies. You know, yes. I mean, of course, they died 51 years ago, but I don't. I just the fascination with the case after all the characters or the people involved with it or the periphery dies, I figured that this, this is just get forgotten. Like like Fatty Arbuckle, you know, that not a yeah. lot of people talk about that, and there's not a lot of people with firsthand knowledge that, that are around to talk about that with. But with Tarantino, you know, although he he ad, 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 adapted or adjusted the actual history of the case, uh, which in one way is a, is a wonderful thing because it was fabulous to watch. On the other hand, there's a generation of people coming up that are think that's the way it really happened. So uh, the one thing is for sure they won't be forgotten now. It, they're going to be part of history forever. You know, like people are studying Hitchcock films forever. They'll be doing the same with Tarantino movies. And, and that makes me happy that these people will not be forgotten. Mm, it makes me happy too. Did you hear about that book though that just came out about Manson? I know there's a couple, but uh, I don't. I don't know which one you're referring to. This this newer one. Um, this guy spent 20 years researching this. That Manson may may have been a um, part of a an FBI experiment on LSD. Right. Yeah, I know the book you mean. Uh, yeah. Chaos. Tom O'Neill. Yeah. 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 What do you think about that? I think that. Uh, you know, as I mentioned to you before, I, I'm not really big on conspiracies. Right. And um, I will say, though, Neil came up with some very interesting uh, facts that were kind of hiding in, faint, in plain sight. For instance, you know, during the trial, you know, there are a lot of things going on. Vietnam was going on still, and, and uh, a lot of people were protesting the war. A lot of, you know, there was a, a lot of civil rights. I mean, that civil rights are, I'm not saying it was exclusive to then. I mean, it was going on, you know, since the beginning of time. But there were lots of things that were happening back then. And President Nixon, you know, he was trying to maintain his conservative following and try to make hippies look bad. And the thing that really stood out to me that O'Neill pointed out was, uh, you know, President Nixon used Manson as a scapegoat. I don't think they ever met. I don't think they ever knew anything was going on at all. I mean, I, he just knew that Nixon knew that Manson was just a symbol for this counterculture hippie movement. And President Nixon, who was a, a, a lawyer, you know, he knows the way the law works, during the trial uh, said that Manson was guilty. To you know, During the trial said that out loud. Here's a man, Charles Manson, who is clearly guilty of murder, which is not true either because Manson has never been found guilty for murder. Yeah. However, somehow, some way, you know, Charles Manson got a newspaper, and the headline of that newspaper was Manson guilty, Nixon declares. And he got it in the courtroom and held it up to the jury. And all of the jury saw that President Nixon thinks Manson's guilty before the case even went to the jury. And, uh, and that case was not thrown out. And that, those, are, those are some the facts that O'Neill pointed out that I thought was really, really interesting, uh, that there might be more at work uh, behind the scenes that I'm aware of. Um, but I, I tend to go with the simplest solution. Mm hmm. I, I I think so too. Yeah, it does make an interesting story though, especially yes. with the with the in depth uh, he talked about on Joe Rogan's podcast and David Feldman's podcast. It, a lot of stuff that made sense. And what what made me laugh out loud though was the fact that Vincent Bugliosi was coming off of a scandal when he took the the case because uh, he accused the milkman of of screwing around with his wife, and so he was like you know getting close to being fired by the firm because the milkman went to his to went to his uh, boss and, and told him what was going on and stuff. And so, you know, he saw the case as his opportunity of, you know, retiring and becoming an an off an author, you know. Now Bully O C Vincent Bully O C I have um you know, Billy O C did a lot of things as a person uh that you know, a lot of people feel strongly about questionable things. You know, mm -hmm. the prosecution of the case, the, what, the theory of Helter Skelter, the race war between the blacks and the whites, that is questionable. Right. What they do know is that nobody wants to talk about drugs and protection and paranoia and the, the stories that reach far and wide about, you know, what Manson was up to. And, you know, there was, it's a complicated, hugely complicated story that, uh, and Mr. Bugliosi used all the, you know, all the different elements that he grabbed from all sorts of different dire directions and wove together this story and got a guilty verdict. Now, 
I don't, you know, personally, whatever this milkman story is, that, that doesn't have anything to do with the case as far as I'm concerned. You yeah. know, in Bugliosi's Helter Skelter Theory, well, people always say that the book Helter Skelter is, is nonsense, and that's not true. Helter Skelter is the exact documentation of the trial, exactly what happened during the trial. Yeah. Uh, the theory of Helter Skelter is a whole different thing. Right. Uh, as we learned with O.J. Simpson, you know, boring the jury to tears does not work out. You can drum <laughs> in the evidence. You can say, DNA, 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 and people are just like, uh, they start getting really bored, and and I think that's what would have happened back then. If Bugliosi didn't use his helter-skelter theory that he put together with all the elements that did exist and scare the shit out of the jury, pardon my language, but that's what he did. He scared the crap out of the country, he scared the crap out of the jury, and up until that one night in August of 1969, you thought you were safe in your own bed, and you weren't anymore. Abigail Folger was reading a book in bed, and 30 minutes was on the front lawn of the, ho- of the house with 28 stab wounds. So, you know, it felt good to have these people behind bars. However it happened, you know, I, I'm glad he did it. And, uh, and it really chaps my ass when people trash Bugliosi. It really does, because, you know, as a human being, whatever. <laughs> no, he, he, he got his job done, and uh, that's what he was hired to do. So, um, exactly. you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of his. I'm not saying that, you know, I think he's a god at all, uh, but I, he got his job done. Exactly, exactly. There was, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I lost my train of thought. You you mentioned something earlier that um, that uh, you wanted to talk about later on. Later on, do you remember what it was? Well, we uh, we just talked about the collecting of things. And, oh yeah, but, um, yeah, yeah. The collecting of things. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, when I was when I was growing up, I can't. I don't understand why, but I would. Well, here's here's a, here's a fun story in my life. Okay. So I told you about the car accidents in front of my house. Right. So my mom was a homemaker. My mom was busy raising four kids while my dad was at work. And my mom had sort of a, you know, she wasn't like an artist, you know. She wasn't somebody that sat there and with an easel or anything like that. But she would doodle. She would doodle on the backs of grocery bags and, car, you know, uh, 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 department store boxes and things like that. She just drew uh, for fun. And she uh, she made a mosaic one day. Uh, I mean, it's a bit more involved. It was over the fireplace, sort of, you know, four feet by two feet mosaic of the three kings, uh, you know, for Christmas. But mm-hmm. the, uh, the mosaic was made out of glass from car accidents. It wasn't contrived. It wasn't something that we thought she was doing that was like, oh, here's something that's really weird. My mom, you know, was a, she just used what we had. So I know that there was like blue glass that she used from the old Vicks Vapo Rub that you used, used to buy. There was blue glass. Uh, and uh, green was from beer bottles. Uh, but most of the other glass was from car accidents. There was headlights and there were mirrors and there were taillights and all this green or all this red and, and silver and white glass pieces were from car accidents. So, you know, my mom would say, I need more white glass. And we would literally step outside and go to the curb and find cracked glass from old car accidents. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was sort of exposed to that in, a, in an odd way. And I, uh, when I was growing up, I used to collect things from weird places uh, where, you know, terrible things happened. And, uh, and that's when, uh, you know, I think it was in 1994 <laughs> when I was at the Tate, uh, the Sharon Tate's old house when it was being demolished and I, and I got a, a large portion of it uh, from the fireplace mm-hmm. and it just spiraled from there and people started send me, sending me things that they had too because uh, they had these one, everyone has this one thing, I picked this up and uh, I don't have any use for it somebody sent me oh, I'm, I'm trying to think, no, I can't think off the top of my head but uh, um you know, there's a piece of a crime scene, like the Amityville Horror House or a piece of the Blair Witch House. You know, people have these weird things. They go, do you want it for your museum? It's like, sure. So I was able to display all these things. And, uh, and you know, the most recent thing somebody gave me uh, was uh, the sink <laughs> the sink that Lucy, from Lucille Ball's house where she used to have her hair done. She had her own little beauty salon, and I have her your beauty salon sink. And, uh, you know, so it's become a larger <laughs> scale of things. You know, I've got a door from George Burns' house and the door from the hotel room that Divine died in. Um, you know, I've got tons of stuff from that. I, you know, recent, I'm looking at right now uh, Zsa Zsa Gabor's father's walking cane. <laughs> you know, it's just <laughs> weird things. 
but there are things that make me giggle, and some of them uh, are quite horrific. But it's all part of history, and uh, mm-hmm. and of course, the largest item that we own is is the Jane Mansfield car wreck. Have Have you ever met John Waters? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I know he's into all of that stuff too. I, I I was reading about him that you know he. He um, he loved to like be at the scene of a car accident in Baltimore. He even he even um, admits that he had fantasies about about car accidents, but he encourages people to have fantasies about them and not actually you know be in them and stuff. You know because he's he's, yeah. he's that weird of a guy. You know, but I heard he's a great guy. Yeah, you know he's a really really nice guy, and he you know we've met I met him a few times and we've spoken uh, at length about things. But when now that I have these items from the room that Divine died in, uh, that sort of cut you know a little bit too close to the bone for him. John Waters has always been obsessed with Jane Mansfield, and his also was his obsession with uh, with car accidents. And you know I invited him to to come and see the car wreck, but because also I, I collected things from Divine, where Divine died, who was a close friend of his. I think you know there's no judgment on his part. I just something that he chooses to not want this to be around because a little bit too close to home but i've never ever uh last time i talked to him about it, a little less than a year ago i think and uh and i just know that it's a little cl- too close for him but there, there's absolutely no animosity about it yeah wow so 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 uh so what have you been doing uh during quarantine well we had to you know hollywood has changed a lot in the last few years as you know, Terry has probably told you. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of uh, really famous places that are gone now. And and uh, uh, the Ambassador Hotel is destroyed where Bobby Kennedy you know, died, but also so many, many wonderful things happen. And, uh, and lots of places are, are being torn down, old restaurants and and uh old houses and and it's it's quite heartbreaking and uh and la has taken a turn and it's not a a turn that i really embraced and we finally had to close our museum down i made that decision Mm -hmm. december and i thought well we're going to just put everything in storage and see how things end up you know what make our decision then uh so we did luckily for us unfortunately uh, for the world, the pandemic hit, but the pandemic hit the day we closed the storage locker. So we had made this decision and we had emptied everything out and put everything away and stored it away. Then COVID hit. So we sort of, um, made the right decision. It was a difficult decision, but we made it at the right time for us personally. And uh, so everything has been in storage. And then for about six, well, four months or five months, I wasn't working at all. And I've been concentrating on doing YouTube videos, little you know, mini biographies that I do online. I did yeah. one on you know, Stephen Parent, the young man who was killed at the Tate House. I did one on Mr. Bugliosi. Uh, not, not necessarily about the case, but it's about them as human beings, where they lived, where they went to school, and where they died, and where they ended up being buried. Um, one I recently did was on Florence Ballard of the Supremes, the Supreme who was fired early on. And, uh, yeah, so that's, and, and the one I'm currently working on is Donald Turnipseed, who uh, was driving the car that killed James Dean. So these are the lesser known people that uh, that uh, never really get featured. Like, I think you understand that completely with, with the people, the actors that you represent. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I like to, uh, to, to talk about people that are, you know, that were involved in interesting things. That uh, that maybe didn't get the attention they deserve. So so that's what I've been doing since quarantine is uh, is concentrating more on that. And now I'm able to do tours again, but only private tours. You know, very very small groups of people. They have to be a single group of people. I can't mix people. And um, so that's what, you know kind of going. You know, step by step, really, at uh, trying to figure things out. But I just, uh, we just bought a house uh, uh, near Palm Springs. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I, I'm not quite sure what the future of Dilly Departed Tours is, but certainly my, uh, I'll, be, I'll be around online, that's for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> I think you dodged a, um, a financial bullet uh, when, when COVID hit, you know, because <laughs> look at everybody um, just taking a tumble over this. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's nothing any one of us could have foreseen, but I think my folks were looking out for me. Yeah, 
And I, I listened to your interview the other day with Heidi Fleiss. <laughs> Wasn't she a hoot? She had a hoot. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. I've interviewed porn stars. I've interviewed people who work in, in, the, in the sex worker field, right? And a couple of them, you know, are not very nice. They're kind of on the defense because they get judged a lot, you know, and stuff like that. But every once in a while, I'll talk to one who's just very friendly, personable, has a great sense of humor, asks me questions, you know. And that's how she was with you. She was just, she was very cool, I thought. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I really, I had a difficult time editing down that interview because it went, we, we talked for quite a long time. And there mm -hmm. were a lot of things that were kind of off the, off the, off the track that I, uh, I didn't think uh, I wanted to include it in that. And for, you know, we talked at length about, about the prostitution thing, and that really wasn't what I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I was glad she went there. But there are certain things I, I took out because it, it changed the, uh, it changed the, I don't know, the, 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 the path of the interview that I wanted, you know, and, uh, yeah. and, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy with the finished product. I really am. And, and you know, gosh, I should have been, in, I've been so lucky to be able to, to meet and talk to some of these people. It's, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, Kelly Rooney, Mickey Rooney's daughter, who, mm -hmm. who I got to speak to, uh, you know, she spoke at length about her mother's murder, uh, Mickey's ex-husband, uh, Mickey's wife and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, the elder abuse that went on towards the end of his life and was oh. able to clarify things to me about Mickey Rooney that uh, uh, you know, made me understand more of a human aspect of him uh, because he's, had, he's another one that has a reputation as being you know, a bit of a, a jerk. Yeah. Uh, so it was interesting to talk to her. So it's been fun. Virginia Graham is a friend of mine now who, who was, the, was the woman who was in prison with Susan Atkins. She wasn't a prostitute, but she was a... Um, an entertainer, we'll say, uh, who, Susan Atkins, who, you know, was largely responsible for the death of Sharon Tate and the others, uh, spoke to her in prison, and Virginia Graham is the one who, you know, ratted her out, for lack of a better term, and broke the case. And now Virginia's a friend of mine. So I'm sure you know exactly what I mean. You research people, you, you find people, and you, you talk to them, and you end up, you hit it off with them, and you end up being friends with them. Mm -hmm. And Heidi, I, I, you know, we, I haven't talked to her since, but uh, I was considering going out and, and, and visiting her if she would have me, and it sounded like she would, uh, to, to, to hang out with her. She was, a, she was a lot of fun to talk to. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, every once in a while you'll, you'll interview somebody you thought you hit it off with and, uh, you know, you want to get together with them, you know, when you're in town or whatever, and they'll just, be, sometimes, sometimes, it has not, it hasn't happened often with me, but sometimes I get, no, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, it yeah. happens, <laughs> you know, but I've been very lucky. I've gotten together with a lot of people and several, several of them I've talked to in the last year want to see me next year, you know, if this whole COVID thing can get under control. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, you've, you've, you've written some books, right? Um, and I've contributed to it a ton, but I've only written one, and that was about uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. But most of my information goes, you know, straight online. That's, that's where I spend my time. <laughs> I've, I've tried to get Little Nell and Patricia Quinn on here for the uh, 45th anniversary, and I've had no luck. I've I've been trying to get them. I've been trying to get the twins from The Shining. You know, every October I do like a month long block of of classic horror movie people and stuff, and I get really lucky. This year has just been terrible because of the election. A, a lot of uh, people I've reached out to have either declined because of the, because of the election coming up and they're just stressed about it, or they just haven't gotten back to me. You know. Yeah, you know, you might consider, you know, uh, uh, approaching them earlier in the year and saving yeah. those interviews for Halloween because those people like that, you know, get 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 inundated at this time. I thought about um, that. And uh, yeah, there's a couple of people that I've, been, you know, that you, you speak to way ahead of time, and then you can use it for that time because a lot of they're booked up. You know, a lot of people are just booked up. Yeah, I have a I have a friend. Uh, she's ten years younger than me. She's like me, an old soul who does a uh, podcast. Um, uh, and she she interviewed uh, somebody named Kari Bible. Do you know her? I know Kari, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I I listened to that interview. I thought she was pretty interesting and stuff. Yeah, Kari's too. sweet and and, she's, and a real uh, a real historian. She is uh, she lives it. She does. I mean, with the way the way Kari is. 
is the way she is. The way she comes off online, the way she shows up in her videos, that is Carrie. She's just a really nice person, and she lives the cemetery. She breathes the cemetery. <laughs> and to know this, you know, this, this uh, it's, it's, it would make me sound like sexist or something like that. I, I don't mean that to be that. Carrie, Carrie dresses like a, a woman from the 30s and the 40s, and this is the way she lives, and she celebrates that era, and, uh, and I just have nothing but respect for Carrie. She could be nicer. I don't think that's sexist at all. Yeah, that's just yeah, who she is. Yeah, I, I, I'll definitely reach out to her. Uh, she's a great conversation. But um, I thank you so much for coming on today, Scott. This has been a lot of fun and very educational. And um, I hope uh, the future for Dearly Departed is, is, a, is a good one because you always have my support. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, plugging the, the, the YouTube channel, Dearly Departed Online. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's become more of my job now. Uh, so I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm going I'm to check out that Kelly Rooney interview, too, because I'm a big Mickey Rooney fan. Cool. But uh, you have yourself a great day, and stay safe. Thank you so much, man. You, too. Thanks for having me on. Take care. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Scott Michaels. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, man, very passionate in um, what he does. And if you haven't um, been on the uh, Dearly Departed Tours, check it out. Because it is very educational and awesome. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past. Because the present sucks. Later, dudes.